My task this evening is to present the third annual Benjamin Franklin Award for Public Service, and our recipient is uh, Professor Philip uh, Zelico. You have uh, some idea of his uh, distinguished uh, background. He was a trial lawyer, then he saw the light, and he became a Foreign Service officer, and then he saw that light, and he eventually ended up on the NSC. Uh, he is uh, uh, an author, uh, and uh, he n most notably the book that he did with uh, Condoleezza Rice called The Germany Unified and Europe Transformed. That's the title of it. I like that book because I got a footnote. Uh, I can attest to its accuracy. He, he really got the story there. Uh, and most uh, notably uh, amongst his uh, public service activities, he was recently counselor to Secretary Rice of the State Department and the executive director of the 9-11 Commission. Uh, which I would rate as one of the most successful public commissions ever undertaken, both uh, because of its lucid and uh, interesting explanation of events, and also because it's of its impact on uh, changing the way the United States does things in some very uh, important areas. I might add that a member of that commission is with us tonight, our very own uh, John Lehman, uh, former Secretary of the Navy, Phil, I can tell you that uh, John is very complimentary about you uh, out of your hearing. Uh, John, uh, I can tell you that I didn't have the courage to ask Phil his opinion of you. <laughs> <laughs> we always uh, try to relate some event or some activity in Benjamin Franklin's long life and public activities to the resume and career of our recipient. And somewhat to my surprise, I discovered that Benjamin Franklin had also directed a public commission investigating a very significant uh, public controversy. Uh, that commission uh, took place, uh, was formed when he was uh, ambassador uh, to France, and it was 1784, and it was a scientific commission to investigate the uh, medical practices of uh, a Viennese named Frederick Anton Mesmer. It was a very distinguished commission. Among its members was uh, a, an eminent medical doctor. His name was Dr. Guillotine. Yes. Uh, he advocated use of the guillotine because he said it was more humane than the ax. Uh, however, he did not tell us his own experience with the guillotine as to whether that was more humane than some other way he could go out. But uh, this was a very distinguished commission, and they looked into Dr. Mesmer's practices, which at that time had deeply divided the scientific and literary and, and governments, uh, government itself uh, in France. He had a theory that the well-being of the world depended upon a kind of a cosmic electricity that came down from, from the stars and that you fell ill when there was an interruption in the flow, and he could restore you. Uh, he would arrange a, a grouping of people around uh, an oak box, which was filled with glass and iron fillings and metal fillings, had holes poked in it. People kept their hands on iron rods pushed into the mixture, while he, in a silk robe, went about poking them with an iron rod, in the areas where they were supposedly ailing. And you were mesmerized, as the expression went. Uh, he developed some kind of a magnetic impact. Well, uh, Franklin and company uh, investigated this, uh, this little business, and they actually did attend a couple of these seances, which the more I read about them, the more they reminded me of the morning meeting with the assistant secretaries of state. Uh, in the defense Dep in, in the State Department, where a good deal of poking and prodding uh, would take place. Uh, and they concluded that while you could be magnetized, uh, there was no such thing as this other fluid, and basically that he was, uh, he was a fraud. They issued two reports. One was public, the other one was private. It went to the king and it pointed out that Dr. Mesmer had a practice of, pra of using his magnetic treatments on young women. They were hypnotized, and they thought this was a rather bad idea. 
it become, should become widespread. This report was published in 20,000 copies. It made a great sensation. It more or less ruined Mesmer, except not so far, because we still use it when we talk about an audience being mesmerized. <laughs> this is what we're talking about. And Franklin, in writing to his son after the episode, he doubted whether he could actually dispel all this, because as he put it, there was a wonderful deal of credulity in the world, and deceptions as absurd have supported themselves for ages." End of quote. We're very happy to present uh, this year's award to a man who has done so much to try to dispel some of these deceptions and some of this credulity about significant events in our history. So if you'd step forward. I'd like to present you with the award, the Benjamin Franklin Public Service Award. It consists of two volumes of the edition, English edition of 1817 of Benjamin Franklin's Secret Correspondence. <laughs> And now I will turn the microphone over to Phil, who will, shall I say, mesmerize the audience. Well, first off, uh, I want to offer my thanks to the Foreign Policy Research Institute, which has been an enormous think tank and presence in my own professional life. I remember when I was first working on issues of foreign policy uh, more than 30 years ago and was going back to graduate school after I'd spent time as a trial lawyer, FPRI and Robert strauss Huppe and the journal Orbis were pillars of the field. It was just one of the essential things that you had to follow and know about. And one of the heartening things in reading the annual report is to see how much not only has that work been kept alive, but how it's nurtured and grown so many other flowers. Uh, some of the efforts that you have on things like teaching military history. The programs that are being run for high school teachers strikes me as an especially powerful and creative way to try to convey knowledge to young people, more creative than I see at many universities around America. I think it's just terrific. The efforts you've got from people like Harvey Sickerman, from Walter McDougall in his program on America and the World, and Walter's work exemplifies the study of that subject for the United States. Uh, the support of people like my old boss, John Lehman. It's, uh, it's really extraordinary. And I think all of you owe a debt to the trustees, chaired by Robert Friedman, and the others that are along with you are helping to allow that institute to continue its work. So uh, thanks very much to the institute. Um, at my table, I was talking to one of my table mates, and this marvelous dessert came out. And he, exactly, and he said, uh-oh, after they eat this dessert, you're going to have trouble keeping them awake. And um, I said, well, uh, what I could do is I could tell them the story about when George Clooney and Brad Pitt and I were on a yacht <laughs> off, on, his yacht, on, on Clooney's yacht off Cannes a little earlier this year, just before the Ocean's 13 premiere. And Pitt had a great story about Angelina Jolie. <laughs> and Rocco Martino at the table, he said, uh, no, no, you have underestimated the people of Philadelphia and its good citizens. <laughs> this is a serious group. They came to hear a serious discussion about America and the world. So I scratched that right out. And I'll have to find some other way of keeping you awake. And actually, I, I can get a little bit of inspiration from what Harvey just said, because when I was a young trial lawyer in Texas, I once had a dog of a case that I was going to have to try to the jury. I had a senior partner. I said, what am I going to do with this? I've got to kind of make it. He said, he kind of pulled back on his suspenders. People wore suspenders more back then. He says, son, you're just going to have to mesmerize them. <laughs> So 
So I'll have to, it's a big crowd to mesmerize. <laughs> so I'll have to try to find some other way of keeping your attention. The job I held most recently in government was as the counselor of the department. Uh, that's not the legal advisor's job at the department. Someone else holds that job. Counselor at the State Department is a very old job at the department, more than 70 years old in its current incarnation. And it's for a long time just been sort of an unofficial deputy for the secretary who works on whatever problems the secretary happens to find most intractable. <laughs> so naturally, I spent a lot of time in Iraq. Um, uh, flying on helicopters and seeing all kinds of different colors of sand and a lot of other things. I worked on problems like North Korea, Iran, the Middle East peace process, all of which you can see are now being satisfactorily wrapped up. <laughs> but one of the advantages of this position um, is that it did give me a chance to really look again at a whole wide array of different issues on a lot of different subjects with the privilege of public service, I had the opportunity to really get some sense on how a lot of different problems are developing in a lot of different parts of the world. And it was reflecting on that experience that I came at the talk I want to give to you tonight on the ambitious subject of globalization and civilization. And I'm going to try to make three points to you. First, that to most of the world, globalization is a fundamental issue. To lead the world, American leaders must talk about it. Instead, we're talking around it. Second big point. I'd like to reflect some on history and on the long argument we've had about what civilization means. And third, I'd like to talk about how to relate hopes for a global civilization to an American foreign policy agenda. So first, I promised that I'd talk about the fact that to most of the world, globalization is a fundamental issue. I think American leaders must talk about it if we want to lead, but instead we're talking around it. As politicians and pundits render judgments about this presidency and muse about the tasks awaiting his successor, it is a good time to step back and reflect upon America's place in the life of the world. Since the Second World War, the United States has played a central role in shaping the content and direction of world politics. Some of you have heard the expression that we live in a unipolar world. I do not use this term. A central role means being a sometime organizer, agenda setter, clearinghouse, facilitator, and contributor for international enterprises of every kind. Having the central role carries with it a burden of constant public attention, often just as an automatic focal point for curiosity or complaint. But being at the center of attention doesn't necessarily confer power over events. Central is not the same as dominant. On its own, the United States has never had enough power to act alone as a global lawgiver or law enforcer. The United States cannot direct world affairs with brute strength. And most Americans would rather not try. Where the United States has been most effective, it is because our government or our private institutions brought ideas, drive, and ingredients that stimulated or sustained some program of effective common action by a wider group. In a bewildering, confusing, globalized world, the United States currently brings a bewildering, confusing melange of ideas to the policy table. We talk about terror, democracy, proliferation, trade, the environment, growth, and dozens of other topics. We strike a hundred notes, but there is no melody. The end of the Cold War opened up an age of fully globalized interaction in commerce, politics, and culture. As Secretary Rice and I have both noted before, this new era is one in which the key issues are more transnational than international. Cutting across societies instead of being defined principally by borders and power blocks. A little more than a year ago, 
Ben Bernanke observed in the dry way we expect from Fed chairman that, quote, the emergence of China, India, and the former communist bloc countries implies that the greater part of the Earth's population is now engaged, at least potentially, in the global economy. There are no historical antecedents for this development. Close quote. Earlier this year, the Director of National Intelligence, Mike McConnell, gave his annual assessment to the Congress. Just to set the scene, this assessment, a bureaucratic consensus document, observed that globalization is, quote, the defining characteristic of our age, close quote. Rare for bureaucrats to come to so firmly to such a universal conclusion. Look, unprecedented forces are in motion. Every nation feels this. But as societies, we do not understand these new forces. And we are not sure our governments can master them. Pollsters recently approached citizens in half a dozen wealthy countries, the places that seem to be benefiting the most from globalization. The pollsters asked people whether they had positive or negative views about globalization, this defining characteristic of our age. Their views were negative. Except in Germany, the issue was not even close. In America, about 18% had a positive view of globalization. 48% were negative, the rest were unsure. In Britain, the negatives outnumbered the positives by more than three to one. Why? My guess is that although fears about outsourcing or job insecurity might be on the surface, such strong worries come from concerns that are wider and deeper. These worries about globalization arise not only from those insecurities, but from an inchoate sense that, in some way hard to express, people fear that they are being swept along by forces that are beyond their control, forces that are beyond their country's control, forces that are even beyond their understanding. The leading American political candidates in both parties support an open world. They support full American engagement to shape it. So they need to find a way to come to terms with the apparent fact that the public and the people of other leading countries are so negative about the defining characteristic of our age. Nearly 10 years ago, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan warned that, quote, Globalization is a fact of life, but I believe we have underestimated its fragility. The problem is this. The spread of markets outpaces the ability of societies and their political systems to adjust to them, let alone to guide the course they take. History teaches us that such an imbalance between the economic, social, and political realms can never be sustained for very long." Close quote. How much more true that warning seems today. And right now, times are good. The sun is shining. World economic growth has been exceptionally strong. As any engineer can tell you, a structure is best judged by how it performs under stress. And despite the construction of excellent initial foundations in 1990 and 1991, the international system built on those foundations in the last 16 years does not seem very sturdy. Even in the best of times, the most high-minded governments encompass a natural tug of war between narrow self-interest and the costs or sacrifices required by arguments about longer term or shared interests. Those larger notions have a chance in the political tug of war only if they are animated by some ideas compelling enough to pull their end. If the ideals are weak and superficial, if the structures of great power cooperation and multilateral institutions are weak, then they may come apart in a storm. The counterweight to the world of zero-sum rivalry will vanish. That side of the rope and the tug of war will be dropped. All the forces will run toward the anarchy of all against all. World War I was followed by a new internationalism in politics and economics. 
But international leadership after the war was weak and divisive. Britain, which was in the lead, failed to build solid structures that could unite its potential partners in France and America. At last, after years of violent turmoil that engendered new bitterness, some promising structures began to rise. But they had little time to settle and gain strength before the Great Crash. Between 1931 and 1933, the leaders of the few remaining democracies effectively abandoned the new internationalism. The lovely new Palais Wilson stood there in Geneva with its inviting gardens and ornate halls. That's what it was called, the Palais Wilson. But the business of the world had moved on, onto fields and jungles. What ideals, then, can strengthen support for an open world? What large policy framework can help people of many nations to comprehend their community's place and sense of identity in a threatening modern world, orienting them to fruitful forms of joint action? During the Cold War, containment and deterrence provided such a big common framework. It did not end debate. The concept framed the debate. Since the Cold War ended nearly 20 years ago, neither the United States nor its friends have found a framework of comparable breadth to guide common effort. Such a big framework has to employ a concept and a vocabulary that finds ready traction far beyond America. Notice China, for instance. President Hu Jintao's carefully prepared report to the just concluded Party Congress repeatedly emphasized his government's commitment to an open, globalized world. But beyond, quote, moderate prosperity for China, the goal for the rest of the world was just described as, quote, the path of peaceful development. And the path was described in the language of process, not purpose. Given America's central role, we have a chance to guide the conversation. What can our leaders contribute? What overarching concepts are we offering? Well, candidate number one. The central concept is a war on terror. The war on terror, or something like it, may be a necessary part of a general framework. But it is not broad enough to comprehend and guide what America is trying to do in the world, much less the policies of countries we hope will join with us. Candidate number two. The central concept is the attainment of democratic governance. Or, to quote another much publicized recent formulation, liberty under law. Also worthy, yet also too narrow. Is this the solution to the worldwide energy and environment crisis? To the spread of nuclear weapons? To the future of the global economy? To the spread of global crime? The objection is not so much to the principle. Practically all states will acknowledge, at least rhetorically, that they support democratic values. That's the currently preferred diplomatic phrase. The more serious objection is that the core concept seems to overlook so many immediate problems that it sounds as if we are proffering a kind of patent medicine, a universal nostrum that will cure whatever ails your society. Then, because the vocabulary is so rooted in our model of governance, we trigger all the usual resentment of American sanctimony. Candidate number three. The central concept is a return to realism. Academics and pundits regularly pose a choice between realism and idealism. The dichotomy is false. Yes, in the world of politicians, these are fancy ways to accuse someone of incompetence while claiming that your side is the one that, as the Chinese would say, finds truth from facts. And yes, in the world of theorists, there is an argument among different schools of thought with artificial labels like these. Yet in the world where American policies are daily carried into practice by legislators, officials, and soldiers. The argument between realism and idealism is a rather idle exercise. Ideals and value judgments 
explicit and implicit, are woven tightly into the fabric of every alternative policy that can be put on the American table. So at least in American policymaking, arguing whether we favor realism or idealism is about as useful as arguing whether we might prefer children either with a mother's chromosomes or a father's chromosomes. In life, all the children have both. Too often, the American debate is reduced to a cartoon. The unilateral regime changers versus the multilateral regime coddlers. These are straw men, stuffed puppets for those who want to be entertained by an American Punch and Judy show. So let me turn to my second theme, to reflect on history a little bit and reflect on our long argument about building civilization. The current debate does not, at least so far, seem to offer any very promising candidate formulations of a comprehensive concept. Perhaps more suggestive insights can be found in the past. The problem of how to define common international purposes for the world is not new. During the late 19th century, new ideas, industrial capacities, and new forms of commerce were rapidly transforming the most developed countries in the world. Global empires extended their reach with astonishing ease, carrying their political rivalries to new corners of the earth. Populations expanded faster than ever before. Millions of people were in motion, leaving the countryside to settle in the industrializing cities or leaving their country behind for new continents. Everywhere, traditional beliefs and ways of life were battered and eroding. Pe trying to make sense of what was happening around them, figures in public life spoke, wrote, argued about where and how to lead their societies. But as the century closed amid fresh celebrations of progress, many prominent thinkers and politicians of that day thought the worlds they valued were decaying, descending into a kind of anarchy. From every point on the political compass, they wrestled with questions of political identity, moral and religious belief, national power and purpose, economic opportunity, justice, equality, freedom. One of the most thoughtful and literate men of that age was Henry Adams, a renowned man of letters. His father, grandfather, and great-grandfather had all lived at the pinnacle of American public life. In 1900, Adams visited the Paris Exposition. He stood in awe before a 40-foot-high dynamo generating electrical power towering over him and whirring silently. Imagine it, the balding bearded man in his dapper suit, standing there silently, inches away from this giant machine. The dynamo, Adams thought, was a fair expression of the impersonal forces animating his age. He contrasted the dynamo in his imagination with the greatest expression of human force in more traditional ages of men. As his illustration, he contrasted this monumental dynamo with the great cathedral of Chartres. That cathedral represented the finest achievement of traditional 13th century society. Study the fantastic variety and detail of the statuary, the seemingly miraculous scale of the thing in a landscape utterly devoid of anything like it, the artistry of its glass, what social force does this express? The force that produced this vast work, the force it expressed, was the hope and power of faith, faith above all in the Virgin. Adams reflected deeply on this metaphorical contrast of the dynamo and the Virgin. In a pair of books, Mont Saint Michel and Chartres, and its sequel, The Education of Henry Adams, Adams lays out two fundamental themes. One is the struggle for unity of belief. The magnificence of Chartres was a monument of hope for a civitas dei, 
a hope that reached a kind of peak in the 13th century. It was a hope for a spiritual unity of people, in this case, the unity of Christendom, striving with a common faith to realize common ideals. And Adams then contrasts that with the dynamo, its impersonal, inhuman power, a monument to the multiplicity and chaos that modernity had unleashed. Writing about this contrast, Adams is alternately bewildered and bemused. All the while, beneath his veneer of sardonic world weariness, he plainly is hoping that something can reverse a process in which any traditional notion of civilization seems to be decaying, dying from a kind of entropy. When friends would ask him about his politics, he called himself a conservative Christian anarchist. What did he mean by that? Why, no more than that he wanted to start a revolution for ideals that no longer seem to exist. There is a second fundamental theme in Adams' work. It is his wonderment at the sheer scale of the new forces. He played at calculating the vast exponential rate of increase in the physical energy, the commerce, the industry, just in his lifetime, which had begun in the 1830s. Then he would observe the follies of essential incomprehension of the human beings who, while they thought they were riding these forces, were really more their creatures than their masters. Adams would have agreed completely with the observation of the French premier, Georges Clemenceau, who darkly observed, human beings are like apes who have stolen Jupiter's thunder. Here's how Adams summarized both these themes, the entropy of values, the match of human society against modern forces. In a 1905 letter to a scientist friend, quote, I am trying to work out the law of expansion from unity, simplicity, morality, to multiplicity, contradiction, police. The assumption of unity, which was the mark of human thought in the Middle Ages, has yielded very slowly to the proofs of complexity. The stupor of science before radium is proof of it. Yet it is quite sure, according to my score of ratios and curves, that at the accelerated rate of progression shown since 1600, it will not need another century or half century to tip thought upside down. Law, in that case, would disappear as theory or a priori principle and give place to force. Morality would become police. Explosives would reach cosmic violence. Disintegration would overcome integration. Close quote. Adams was all too prescient. He died as one world war came to a close, inspiring many dissents like Albert Schweitzer, that quote, the suicide of civilization is in progress and the next landslide will very likely carry it away. And the next landslide almost did. New ideas had come forward for the organization of human society. And the struggle among these ideas came to dominate the 20th century. But the two challenges that Adam posed remain. They can be expressed as two questions. Can the nations define and sustain a civilized world in this modern globalized era? And second, can human beings constructively master the unnatural and unprecedented forces set into motion in this modern globalized era? Hold those two questions in mind and consider the observations of another perceptive student of the past. Early in the 21st century, the most renowned American scholar of world history, William McNeil, was wrapping up a lifetime of work. In a masterly summary of how human society has evolved over thousands of years, McNeil explains how primary cell-like communities had progressed into civilizations. And, quote, what began as separate civilizations followed a familiar path by blending into an ever more powerful global cosmopolitan web that now prevails among us, close quote. Yet, like Adams at the beginning of the 20th century, 
McNeil at the beginning of the 21st felt, as he puts it, a heightened sense of insecurity. How long, he asked, will all the complex flows sustaining us endure? Flows not just of food and energy, but also of meaning, hopes, and aspirations, uniting and dividing humankind more forcefully than ever before. Close quote. And like Adams again, McNeil not only raised the issue of human purpose, but also of human capacity to master the forces the species had unleashed. Quote, can humankind, in short, somehow adapt to radically new circumstances, largely of our own creation, as our predecessors did in times past? Close quote. Civilization is a term that resonates powerfully in every part of the world. In Singapore, perhaps the most globalized place on the planet, you will find that the government exhibits cultural heritage in a museum of Asian civilizations. So it's not just an American word or a European word. In our own language, the root word is the Roman civilis, connecting it to the life of citizens. One great French scholar and statesman of a bygone revolutionary age, 150 years ago, a man who spent much time reflecting on the meaning and progress of civilization, preferred a common sense meaning to the word, referring to, quote, the perfecting of civil life, close quote. In other words, civilization is a notion of progress. It's a notion of progress. The progress of how people organize and govern themselves. The progress is social and it is individual because it's progress in the opportunity that the civil life creates for the acquisition of knowledge and refinement of arts, or even for moral progress. As is the sad fate of most compelling ideals, the term has been abused, belied, and corrupted by people acting in its name. Angry at the hypocrisy of civilizing colonizers, Mark Twain eloquently wondered in 1901, whether we should, and I'll quote here, we should go on conferring our civilization upon the peoples that sit in darkness, or shall we give those poor things a rest? <laughs> shall we bang right ahead in our old time, loud, pious way, and commit the new century to the game? Or shall we sober up and sit down and think it over first? Close quote. Twain was right. Because a global civilization cannot be fashioned from what Twain condemned, an American product manufactured in an adulterated form, falsely labeled and fit only for export. It will have to be developed and implemented out of a conversation about shared ideals, ideals that Americans will have to live up to as much as anyone else. So in the context of 21st century politics, to assert that global civilization is an essential goal is to make an argument. I'll make it. There is civilization in the world. Frankly, some of it is represented right here in this room by the kind of reason that caused all of you to gather here tonight. And there is barbarism. When extremists behead innocent victims on television, this is not just another form of civilization. And we gravely insult Muslims if we imply that it is. Shortly after the Cold War ended, Harvard professor Samuel Huntington famously outlined a quite different concept, one in which the world is divided into several civilizations with great clashes to come on the fault lines between them. But I always thought the more interesting fault lines were the ones inside the civilizations not the ones between them. Today, the fundamental issue for Arab and Muslim society is about how or whether to adapt their societies to the modern globalized world. Modernity has already spread within their world. The argument goes on inside their world. The debaters use outsiders in their arguments, holding them up as potential enemies or partners. But they are arguing about different visions within their existing cultures. Think about the arguments this year in Turkey, in Indonesia, in the United Arab Emirates, or right now in Pakistan. 
That is the critical dynamic. Huntington's argument, by emphasizing the supposed single identity of the disparate civilizations, thus misses what is most important. To be fair to him, he understands that these civilizations are not yet perfectly homogenized. So he predicts that the xenophobes in these civilizations will fight to unify them against outsiders. And that is just what people like bin Laden or Ahmadinejad argue to their fellow Muslims. Unite to fight the infidel. Huntington's prediction is really just another argument. Unfortunately, it is an argument that resonates best with the enemies of a global civilization. In the book he later wrote to expand on his article, Huntington made a little noticed addition to his argument. He conceded that the civilizations around the world were connected by some common tissue of ideas, but he thought the connecting layer was thin. Yet it is precisely because there are differences, precisely because the world is not flat, precisely because arguments are going on within communities about how or whether to adapt to global life, that we need to pick up the other end of the rope and pull. We and others who hope to retain the positive features of an open world need to make a better argument about the ties that bind. An argument for global civilization has the burden of defining common ideas that are already in view. These are ideas that have emerged across the world out of painful struggle. Some hard-won founding principles for perfecting a common vision for civil life. My tentative and very subjective cut at this has five ingredients. First, respect for the identities of others. Modern life has separated people from traditional roots. So they work hard to define their identity around different communities. Identity is who we think we are. Americans, Chinese, Methodists, Buddhists, Jews, tennis players, engineers, the list can go on and on. Modern civilized societies respect the identities others have chosen and that communities have fashioned so painfully for themselves, consistent with their civic duties to government and to each other. Second, cooperative prosperity. Cooperative prosperity. Modern civilization relies on interdependence. And the reglobalization of the world economy in the last generation has yielded massive benefits from specialization and exchange. The era since 1950 is, and I'm quoting the McNeils here, the most unusual in the history of economic growth in all of human history. Although many people, having experienced nothing else, now imagine it is normal. Third, mutual, mutual security. Mutual security. In a modern civilization, states cannot secure themselves by making everyone else insecure. Much of the 20th century was dominated by struggles against countries that adopted mutations of social Darwinism as their new religion, their dominant guide to domestic and international life. To them, the life of their nation was a struggle for survival of the fittest. War was natural and inevitable. The purpose of life was to prepare for the struggle in order to prevail. Reliance on others was weakness. Fortunately, the governments most dedicated to the principle of survival of the fittest did not, in fact, survive at all. But they brought all hope for civilization to the brink of ruin, not just by their own acts, but also by what the victors had to do in order to prevail. Fourth, stewardship of the planet. The principle is obvious. What is becoming more evident is that the forces we have set in motion are creating serious artificial risks to planetary health. As a society, we are accustomed to allocating enormous resources to manage risks much more modest than the ones now looming before us. Fifth, limited government. 
limited government. On examination, it is hard for any nation to participate meaningfully in any of these first four ingredients of a global civilization if they grant free reign to dictators and enslavers. Tolerance, cooperative prosperity, mutual security, a sense of stewardship flow more easily in governments that have come to terms with modernity in a way that balances the space accorded on the one hand to state power and the space afforded on the other to individual expression and human dignity. The enemies of civilization have a rival set of beliefs. In our modern age, where civilized communities respect the identity of others, uncivilized ones insist on single identities, usually of blood, soil, or God, that trump all others and tramp upon them too. Where civilized communities believe in limited government, uncivilized ones grant unlimited power to rulers who can enslave and kill others in the name of the higher ideal, which is usually the triumph of their exclusive community. Where civilized communities believe in cooperative prosperity, uncivilized ones enrich themselves by beggaring their neighbor. They understandably expect others to fear and distrust them. Therefore, they must gather all the resources they need into their own domains. Where civilized communities believe in mutual security and hope for peace, uncivilized ones believe conflict is natural and appropriate and they dream of triumphal war. Where civilized communities accept responsibility for stewardship of the planet, uncivilized ones focus only on the self-interest of the moment. There are other enemies of civilized behavior for a modern world, enemies that are more subtle. Inertia is one, whether from fatalism, inattention, or complacency. Despair is another. The hopelessness of people so poor, materially or in spirit, or so alienated, that they are drawn to the lure of violent exaltation. And hopes for a common world are profoundly opposed to those who work toward a self-fulfilling prophecy of a global clash of civilizations. Which brings me then to my third theme, how to relate this ideal of global civilization to the American foreign policy agenda. If America and other fortunate nations should make a renewed effort to foster and protect a modern global civilization, how should they go about doing it? A benevolent empire or hegemony is no answer. Americans do not want the job. Even if they did, they're not strong enough to do it. Nor is any world government in prospect that can fill the bill. Returning to an older world of selfish powers balancing against each other is no solution either. It is a dangerous possibility, but it would do more to threaten civilization than to preserve it. Instead, the leading nations of the world need to join in pursuing common interests while respecting local choices. Common interests, yet local choices. Globalization cannot be sustained without an explicit balance between common values and respect for local identity. The Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen explained this very well. Uh, he said, quote, there is a compelling need in the contemporary world to ask questions not just about the economics and politics of globalization, but also about the values, ethics, and sense of belonging that shape our conception of the global world. Involvement with such issues need not demand that our national allegiances be altogether replaced by a global sense of belonging to be reflected in the working of a colossal world state. In fact, global identity can begin to receive its due without eliminating our other loyalties. Identity and purpose cannot be forged across six billion people as in a distributed network that all the IT people here know about. The web that connects us must still respect and even encourage local, autonomous, primary communities. Nations and their sovereign communities 
must make their own choices about the character of their societies and the way in which they participate in a civilized world. McNeil came to a similar conclusion. Indeed, he found it strikingly ironic that having graduated from cell-like communities to an increasingly shared civilization, quote, we and our successors must change our ways by learning to live simultaneously in a cosmopolitan web and in various and diverse primary communities. How to reconcile such opposites is the capital question for our time and probably will be for a long time to come, close quote. The most obvious alternative, he added somberly, is collapse of the existing web, which would bring radical impoverishment, catastrophic die-off, and perhaps, if humankind survived, a new start on the basis of local broken fragments of the web. I conclude, McNeil wrote, we live on the crest of a breaking wave. Luck, intelligence, and Awkward tolerance may keep the web from breaking. Let's hope so. Close quote. Many individuals are beginning to explore how this balance of common interest and local choice can be struck. For example, um, Amitai Etzioni has helped organize a network of people working together on a communitarian policy agenda that shares many of these same premises. But here are five illustrations of how the broader concern for global civilization can drive an American foreign policy agenda. First, construct an agenda to protect the future of the global economy we have now created. An agenda for the future of the global economy. For nearly 200 years, the international economic agenda has been devoted to building structures for trade and exchange among national firms. The agenda should be revised and enlarged to put the new realities in the foreground. An entirely new world of international capital flows, born about 30 years ago out of the wreckage of the old Bretton Woods system, is growing to giant proportions, filling out with the presence of enormous sovereign wealth funds. Many of the firms want global investment frameworks for their own protection. Many of the potential recipients need a common framework to get more transparency and protection for their citizens. Even the character of national currencies themselves is being reconsidered. Or to look at another dimension, a new world of transnational business operations at once defies easy classification of a firm's nationality while subjecting firms to a blizzard of different laws and rules. Again, for the net benefit of all, a common framework for regulation can help protect both vulnerable citizens and economic growth. You know, the smartest people doing global business today would prefer global regulatory cooperation to the patchwork of investment rules, product standards, and competition policies they now have to sort out in order to operate around the world. By the way, you can find that in the writings from the American Chamber of Commerce. The solution will not be one size fits all. It would just address head on the task of balancing common goals and local choices instead of talking around it. One of the great mistakes of the 1920s was that the great economic leaders of the day looked backward trying to rebuild an anachronistic gold standard that was itself becoming part of the problem. We should not repeat this mistake in a new form. The agenda for the world economy should look forward. Second, fashion a program of inclusive, sustainable globalization, above all for the 50 or so nations that Paul Collier has called the bottom billion, the people who are being left behind. This is an extraordinary agenda, and I'm glad to say, though, that the New World Bank president, Bob Zellick, outlined just such an agenda with that name last month. It is an excellent place to start. And if you're interested, I urge you to take a look at Zellick's speech on the World Bank website. And Paul Collier's book, The Bottom Billion, isn't a bad place to begin either. 
Third, foster a coalition approach to combating transnational terrorism and other forms of transnational crime. A civilized world would unite against violent extremists who have regional or global reach. We want the world to reach out to prevent attacks. So for its part, the United States must keep building a firmer moral and legal foundation for common action in the way our country and its partners treat captured suspects. And stronger coalitions can regularize the exchange of relevant information, too. The world does a far better job tracking lost credit cards than it does tracking lost passports. But Islamist terrorism is just one part of a larger theme, the rise in transnational crime as a problem of global public order. Also serious, though less discussed, is the breakdown of public order in significant parts of Central America. Mexico itself is coming to the brink of a strange new kind of civil war. Conventional ideas and capabilities for outside aid have not been a good fit. Fresh thinking and different ways of doing business are needed, as NATO has discovered in Afghanistan. In other words, where in the industrial age, we identified strategic areas by their concentration of producers of coal and steel, in this new era, the most critical areas may be the wilderness areas of the world on the frontier of civilized norms. Harvard professor Samantha Power summarized the strategic challenge this way, quote, to me, the greatest problem perhaps when it comes to dealing with any of these threats, whether it's the rise of new powers, the rise of rogue nations, the rise of transnational jihadists and so forth, is the problem of the commons. It's that actually very few actors within the international system want to play in the commons, want to make sacrifices domestically want to have difficult domestic conversations about committing police forces to any kind of antidote to failing states." Close quote. So any common agenda must come to grips with how to talk about the commons, how to create that powerful public pull for a civilized world that can balance against the understandable tug of reluctance on the other side. Fourth. Place the world's immediate concerns about the proliferation of nuclear weapons in places like Iran in the right context as a necessary part of a broader civilizational agenda to eliminate all nuclear weapons in the world. The elimination of nuclear weapons is not a utopian vision. It is the view of hard-headed Republicans and Democrats like former Secretaries of State Henry Kissinger and George Shultz as well as former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, recalling Ronald Reagan's longstanding dream. I attended a conference on this just last month where Nancy Reagan wrote a letter thanking everyone who was there for keeping Ronnie's dream alive. The United States, remember, decided to build the bomb in 1941 and 1942 as part of a way of war that relied on a relatively small army we cut in half the army we had intended to build to win the war. Balancing that with big technology, air power, firepower. That way of war remained valid for 50 years. But now, we have the most powerful army on Earth. And nuclear weapons are the resort of our enemies. That's what they use to offset us. The geopolitical premises have not only disappeared, they flipped. The United States should help reset the global agenda in line with today's strategic realities. And a program to eliminate all nuclear weapons in the long term could help the international community make tough commitments now to prevent violent revolutionary states like Iran from acquiring them, since it would set the long-term vision so far back. Fifth, develop a global framework for local choices about how to reduce the world's dangerous reliance on oil and dirty coal. By the way, a strong vision for managing the use of nuclear energy 
links up with this problem too. World oil supply is already moving toward a state of deepening and continuous crisis. Though some believe, actually John Lehman and I did a simulation on just this problem only a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C. Robert Rubin played the national security advisor. John was promoted to being the fictional secretary of defense. I played the fictional director of national intelligence. And folks, I've got to tell you that after we'd worked on this problem for a few hours in simulation, the world was in the toilet. <laughs> but what was scary about the simulation, of course, was how entirely plausible it was and how acute the dilemmas were. Though some believe oil is mostly controlled by the big oil, international oil companies like ExxonMobil or Chevron, in fact, 96% of the world's oil reserves are now controlled by national oil companies, including the state-controlled Russian and Chinese companies. In general, such suppliers tend to pay rents to their authoritarian governments. They tend to underinvest in expanding production. They tend to manipulate supply for political reasons. On current trends, very tight supplies and the resulting serious price shocks will produce a constant danger of sharp global economic recession or worse. Meanwhile, these trends exacerbate points of friction in competition for resources. And they help countries like Iran finance their outlaw development of nuclear weapons. The current trends in use of oil and dirty coal also threaten to do terrible damage to the planet itself. The risks of tremendously damaging climate change are now unacceptably high. Again, I phrase this as an issue of risk. And you analyze the risk and look at it. And my judgment and the judgment of some economists and others I respect and scientists, the risks are now very high. All the major proposals for dealing with the energy environment dilemmas rest on a global framework with wide participation, very much including China. And all the most attractive frameworks will then create settings that structure many kinds of local choices for energy productivity or for more truthful pricing of energy products that incorporate some of the negative externalities. These five topics are just illustrations of a foreign policy agenda that could be designed with a consistent theme of strengthening the emergence of a global civilization that can handle the strains of a modern world. They illustrate how many common human dreams we can embrace in such a framework. Recall Henry Adams at the Paris Exposition, reflecting on the force represented by the giant dynamo on the one hand, the force represented by the great cathedral on the other. Can we preserve the ideal of a global civilization? Can we stay ahead of the forces we have set in motion? One chapter of world history is over. Another is just beginning.